Okay, so now let's have some discussion around that. I think my own reading of what Damon have presented, it's, it's about unfolding the design or the planning process and seeing how to involve people in it. So this is participatory. Uh, modes of, uh, of of getting the design on the plan, but also about how to make it centered around the people themselves. Um, what does this mean in Egypt, where in certain areas the state has been absent, you know, completely for many many years, and and um, um, which is the impact of this? I mean. Um, it's interesting to, um, as you were proposing, of course, going deep into communities and to see how are they organizing more and more. Uh, but um, what is the impact of the lack of, you know, state and government? Does, does this have an impact of, you know, um, uh, the imaginary or the way they organize themselves, if, if they have completely uh, autonomous rules or uh, organization. So, uh, so this is the question. I don't know if it was clear. Uh, the second is, um, uh, of course, it's, it's very nice, and I totally agree with you that planners and architects, and they have, you know, the, the power. The power. They have tools to give um, responses. But um, um, which are the tools that you are in the, in the specific cases you um, you proposed? Which which are the tools that were used to get in touch with communities and analyze their needs? So which is I mean there is a process before giving solution, you know, that uh, it's that negotiates with communities and investigate and stuff. So my question is about uh, the period that this pro all these projects took to uh, get in touch with communities and, you know, make an analysis before giving responses. So a methodological approach. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you all of you for really great presentations. Um, I just had two um, detailed questions just in terms of the presentation, the first presentation, which was um, that I can't remember in which of the three examples you were saying that the local community had applied pressure um, and through that pressure they were able to, for example, new things about the budget uh, that was allocated to the redevelopment of their neighborhoods and uh, or the streets. And so I just wanted to know in those specific examples um, exactly like how was it that they were able to get the budget like was it through you know personal connections was it through an a pathway that could be repeated in other uh, examples and yeah and was that pressure that you were also mentioning was that somehow also um, visible pressure or you know um, legal pressure and so on uh, yeah those were my two questions can, can people also introduce themselves yeah, yeah. and my name is Malik Halmi I'm an artist and uh, yeah <laughs> first yeah, I'm, I think I'm Jennifer Bremer from AUC. Um, one of the, the things that I think is very, very sort of interesting and sort of thought-provoking in a lot of this is, is um, the question of the asset-based approach as opposed to the, um, the need-based kind of community analysis. And um, I'm really struck by the, the role, for example, that local lawyers could play. And indeed, all of the informal areas, um, although I'm thinking of now we should call them self-organized um, areas, um, that they all have lawyers. And they also have a lot of a lot of teenagers with not a lot to do. Um, so, so there is real, and many, many of whom you know, are at least uh, secondary educated. So, so there is, I think, a lot of potential to, to see what are the assets that could be mobilized to bring this, to collect this information, bring this pressure, et cetera. Um, another aspect of it, something that I've wanted to do but admit I have not actually done, would be to sort of replicate a thing that goes on in the U.S. in which communities visit each other. I mean, chambers of commerce are always visiting each other. And one of the things I wanted to do, but like I say, I have not done, um, is, is to take the people, say, from some of the groups that we're working with in Haganah, to take them to Adalua or to take them to meet Okba to really see these projects. Because it's very good to bring them together, as I think you mentioned you were doing. But there's something about the field trip 
um, about going together like we did the you know, yesterday or whatever, uh, but I mean in general for people to really see something firsthand and meet the people who are doing it, um, you know, is, is also I think can be something that could be very, very useful. Um, I'm not sure how one would bring these things together operationally, but I do think there's a lot of potential to try to mobilize community assets and, and try to bring people into contact at the grassroots level, which they totally are not at this point. I had a question for Karim and Diane about the second set of examples they had from Nahla, uh, Nahya. Um, I guess I have a bit of discomfort around the, the micro enterprise approach or the entrepreneurial approach to something that we, to things that we typically think of as state service provision. And I think for some reason it, it hit me particularly strong with the water example, um, perhaps because we've seen in other countries what bad things can happen when water provision gets privatized. And so I just wanted to get your thought on um, your comfort level and where you would, you, what your thoughts are about what uh, following that type of a route might mean in this context here. Uh, yeah, I'm Paul Jedi. I'm uh, an artist, uh, curator, publisher, and also media. Uh, so I was interested in the communication aspect because, to me, it, I mean, the most important aspect of what you both talked about is the the uh, how to get people together and 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 what sort of devices you can use to get them to communicate or incite them to communicate and uh, to develop ideas because. Uh, in your presentation, it was all about uh, initiatives. I, well, but the question is, how do they start? So, I mean, what would be uh, some sort of a mechanism to put in some seed that could be replicated elsewhere? Um, I mean, uh, I'm a little bit involved in a community in Fayoum, but uh, it doesn't really work the same way. I mean, the, the moment you start grouping people, you, you know, they. Uh, uh, you have those who attend the meeting and those who don't, and then those who have other opinions, and then, of course, those who don't want to pay, and then uh, and then with those who don't like this guy, because this guy is I don't know what, plus the cleavage that you have now between Muslim brothers, Salafis, and God knows what else. Uh, yeah. Researcher and, um, from Zurich. Um, I just want to address a question that I think maybe is related to what um, Clarissa and um, the person speaker talked about. Which is maybe being the devil's advocate, but asking about the limits of participation. One aspect being how um, fixing loop, fixing gaps and, and um, looking for loopholes in the system is also um, maybe accepting a form of disengagement of the state and how that's um, not okay in a way, how, how this shouldn't be. And um, the second relates also to the question of participation. Um, there was a book that was um, published not so long ago called The Nightmare of Participation, which actually uh, reflects on the fact that participation can be a tool um, used as a, an alibi sometimes. How you would just say, well, we've discussed with the communities and we've addressed this and how um, that's the solution we, we led to. And sometimes it's really something that's nothing um, uh, really democratic. Um, and there's also, of course, the question of uh, who are the people who are actually involved in this uh, participation on the process. Thank you. Um, <coughs> my name is Yahya Shaukat. Um, uh, when we're thinking of, uh, like, um, when Diane was talking about uh, local budgets being about, in Egypt, maybe around 10% and other countries going up to about 30%, do you have any sort of idea of like a short-term solution where a lot more money could be hotwired to uh, the local councils and then here we're also talking about then are we giving much more money to unaccountable local government so then that has to go also with some form of accountability so if we're thinking about we're now 2013 so in the, the short term how how could that be possible how could local government get more resources and also become more accountable in in a short amount of time um, uh, the questions I'm gonna ask two questions actually uh, the first one is about um, 
popular committees and participatory decision making. How, um, I mean, Dame, you talked, uh, where are you? There you are. You talked a little about um, whose needs, uh, personal needs or collective needs. How do you prioritize whose needs you address? Um, it kind of relates to um, an experience I had in, in Manchester in the UK, uh, working with uh, communities, um, uh, community uh, groups that would try and prioritize need. And very often, I think, um, I was surprised at the needs that would come to the top of the, that list. Uh, quite often, the, the issues that we'd assumed were the, the biggest issues, for example, in this one neighborhood around violent crime, actually came lower on the list of things they, that they wanted to tackle than, for example, the labeling of bins. And so there's something about the visibility of issues and how many people are affected by them. And also the issues, I think, that are easier somehow to tackle. Uh, do you know what I mean by that? Like, so kind of how do you prioritize them? Do you uh, take exactly as the group has said their order of issues? Or you know, do you look at the, the filtering that they've done in order to kind of say, well, maybe we can't deal with this yet, and, and why? And that kind of leads on to another question that I had um, that mostly comes from work I did in Northern Ireland about gatekeepers and how much time do you spend, and this is to Karina and Diane also, uh, working with gatekeepers, whether they're, uh, I mean, in Northern Ireland we call paramilitaries and ex-paramilitaries community leaders now, and uh, so whether they're um, faith leaders here, Salafis, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, whatever, um, or kind of uh, different types of community leaders, how much time do you spend building links with them and how important is that? And uh, have there been any instances in which um, projects that you're trying to drive forward have been stalled because of difficult relations? Um, thanks. I have a question uh, mostly for uh, Karim and Diane about how you go about uh, guiding uh, or structuring a process where the, the youth or any members of a community would come up with their own plan. Uh, how they defined and, and draw drew out their city or their community. Um, do you uh, approach them with a set of norms, like what it should be, and then they take a step back and, and then try to envision it? Um, and the reason I ask that is because in the case that, that Damon presented, uh, there was a norm. There was, for example, what is affordable housing? There's a a more or less official uh, definition of what that is. And then people can relate to that and, and see how does that norm apply to me and, and what is necessary in order to reach that. So, um, And that relates to what we do as well. But we, we use a normative approach to, to get people to, to say what they want. You know, I'm not sure if this is where you're coming with, but I certainly have a lot of colleagues who are planners and thus fetishized plans as a tool. Um, but I also feel that, that norms can be seen in the same way. You know, I think that in the short term, you know, and, and in the long term, certainly in some ways, a norm is, is super useful, right? Um, one, one can understand easily how that becomes kind of a, 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 of a lever. But I, I guess that my question is in the long term, if we're talking about making things stick, the question has to become, how does a norm actually become owned, right? How does a norm become something that's not dispensed from above us, that either we, you know, you shall not litter, um, you know, how does it become something that not only is owned by us, that, that is our norm, but something that is flexible and something that somehow collectively we have some kind of a judgment to be able to figure out what is an appropriate level of flexibility for a norm? And, and, and maybe one could think that if a norm is flexible, then it's not a norm anymore. But, um, but, but if it is, then, then I think that uh, it's important that we think about what that kind of flexible norm is. And, and I think in, in, in the same notion, I mean, someone brought up Marcus Meeson, I think, uh, who wrote this book about the nightmare of participation. And, uh, and I just think he's, he's horribly mistaken, um, horribly, horribly mistaken and horribly dangerous in terms of uh, what, what, he's, what he's talking about. I mean, certainly we all can think about all kinds of good things that are co-opted by those in power, right? All kinds of innovations by social movements making demands that are co-opted in the name of power, in the name of, of the establishment. Um, 
so you know, I, I don't think that the reaction to that is to criticize participation. I, you know, I think that that is a, a baby with the bathwater going out. You know, but I think that a word that someone did bring up, which is accountability, becomes utterly critical. And accountability as it's linked to legitimacy. Um, you know, no idea, I think, is a solution, uh, you know, unless there's actually an accountability mechanism built into it. And, and no solution, I think, is, is worthwhile unless it has that kind of long-term flexibility um, that is only made possible by, by accountability, uh, you know, to those who have, who have put it forward. And in terms, I guess, the other, the other questions about kind of method and time and how do you approach a community. Um, you know, for, for us in, in these projects that I just show, it, you know, it really begins with what's there. You know, what communities have presented themselves as organized, right? You know, the, 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 the method here is not to create uh, participation or deliberation out of nothing, but I think as a designer, it's about making things that are props, that are tools uh, for those who want to increase their collectivities so they can enter actually into this deliberative process of democracy. Um, it's not about, I think, going in and, you know, I mean, it's about, I think this was in Kareem and in Diane's presentation as well, you know, it's very much about, you know, insight development, you know, another way I think you could say that is valuing what's there. You know, and so how does one learn how to look and recognize what's there? Um, because I think that beginning from an outlook where one believes that nothing's there uh, usually usually leads uh, leads to nothing. So you know, the way that, that it begins, you know, is very much like, oh, I read this newspaper article, and there's you know four people in it. Like, let's call them first. And you know, it's it's very much an expanding, I think, pretty typical research project from that. Like, oh, who else should we talk to? You know, who do you agree with? Who do you not agree with? Um, let's make a list and then call them up until maybe they'll, they'll talk to us. And that's also where uh, rocking out with a bunch of teenagers is really useful, right? Because if you're just like, I am a very serious policy researcher and I want to come and ask you some tough questions, um, that sometimes gets a less friendly response than, oh, I have these teenagers and they're sweet and innocent and, and, and they want to come ask you some questions. So another meaning for uh, the name of, of the organization I mentioned, CUP, is uh, cutting up posers because that's what we, uh, I don't know if people know that, that word, but, but that's, uh, you know, that, 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 that's, what the, uh, that's what the students' instructions are to do. Uh, when they go in, into a meeting. Um, I start with the same point that uh, Damon started with, and I, I, I fully share his opinion about um, nightmare to participation uh, of participation. Uh, I, I fully agree. It, it, I, I don't agree with the arguments of this book, actually. and. Um, I fail to find any grounded um, type of work that has been done through this book to build these like uh, assumptions on reality, and I fail to find them there. Um, I'd like just to draw the attention to one of the uh, sentences that have been said by one of the lawyers, actually was speaking about Azbit Kharala, and none of the people we work with mentioned the word participation at all. Actually, this is a jargon that we like use as like development uh, community. They don't talk about participation, talk about like deliberation and all this stuff. It's, it's about the hard truth of being recognized as a citizen that will see equitable share of the resources of this city. That's as simple as this. So participation to them is not uh, something and an end to like voice their needs to the, to the state. They know how to acquire these needs and they have been doing this for the last 50 years. The point is it's now about like how much resources they can grab into their neighborhoods actually using this kind of pressure. Either by imposing realities, by building on the ground, or like going through this case. If you notice, um, it's, it was mentioned very quickly that so far they haven't gone or got the title to the land, and actually they don't care. That's not the problem, the issue for them. Or the triumph that they um, see in this case, actually, which is still ongoing, there have been another case and there is a third one in the court still uh, to come regarding the same issue of titling of the land. To them, the most important achievement they have been able to, to think is the recognition of the state as a place that's worthy of having uh, utilities actually coming into the neighborhood. And that's how they got access to water and sanitation in 2010, 2011, which is still ongoing. And that was the, the most important issue for them, they, because they know nobody can kick them out. Right? They, like, they have a legitimate right to stay over there and they say we claim our right of having this land. Not from a, a right to housing point of view, but because of they've worked hard to earn this right. So um, 
that's coming about the participation. For sure, participation had its deficiencies, but it's not the main or core element of the discussions we have with uh, uh, such communities. Um, when we talk about targeting the state, um, um, actually people do, and, and they uh, target the state in a way that it's very pragmatic in terms of like um, having access to more um, uh, utilities, having access to more resources. But what's different actually after the revolution is that um, this long-term, let's say, silent agreement between the state and the people of Cairo, or let's say in Egypt, is that um, the state builds like these digital cities and leaves these neighborhoods where people can do whatever. It's no longer there. Um, I, I assume that um, just before the, the last four or five years of the Mubarak era, it was a break of this agreement when the government decided to intervene where people live, actually. And this happened, didn't happen only in the field of uh, urban development, but in agriculture and industry in many cases. And this relationship is still very um, critical, and there is a lot of tension in it, because it will remain. Uh, people will have to engage in the state. The case where, like, we haven't been disengaged and the state does whatever it wants, it's gone forever. And I think the, uh, our task as professionals is to see avenues where this relationship can become uh, less harmful to both sides and uh, that has more deliberation and ways to have this communication. We're talking about like two neighbors, neighbors living with each other for the last 30 years haven't been talking to each other and now they have to live in the same apartment, for example. So we have to figure out how to resolve this uh, uh, relationship. Um, um, as for the lawyers and how to, to people can learn from each other. It's not only about like community visits, but we show these communities, we present what other communities do. And the results are fascinating because they see this type of work that we don't show them examples from Brazil or India or whatever. We show them examples from Mithauba, from Ardelewa, from wherever, you know, and, and, and this like works like magic because they see that other people like them have been able to um, acquire resources and have been able to implement this type of work. Um, and I fully agree with Clarissa about the case of Nahe. Because we haven't found a single case where you can really see it's like a perfect example of where, like, we, what you can be replicated. But uh, we sometimes criticize them, actually. is the access of a public good, actually, that can be sold to the others, resold, actually, because people pay for this uh, water service. But also it raises a question about the PPPs. You know, for example, the public-private partnerships in Egypt, now there is like a, 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 these like um, um, wastewater management plans that are being built by the private sector. And we raise here the question, why are the government is going to partnerships with the private sector on large scale and not going into small and micro enterprises on, on, on the local neighborhoods? If you can twist this a little bit, yeah, and if like, the service is to purify the water, potable water coming to these neighborhoods, why doesn't the government pay for that? And this is the question even raised by the owner of this like, uh, uh, facility, is that why don't I have free access to water as long as I'm, I'm complementing the service that the government was supposed to do in the first place? So there are potentials for other kinds of partnerships that can emerge. And actually, the, the garbage collection case is the same. And I fully agree with you. It's the, there is a, an issue about selling the service that people have paid for before, which is not the case in the garbage collection, for example. This is a service that people have used to, to do that. Um, the um, last point I would like to talk about is the um, deciding about the needs and, and the, the local like leaders and also the issue of, uh, of mapping. Uh, at least from our side, we've been working long enough with communities to know that like there is a big question about the question of like local leaders or like natural leaders. Uh, we prefer to work with different groups of communities so and you discover more because there are like when we work there you find a lot of like inner politics within the neighborhoods actually of like the so-called natural leaders are so in, in many cases they are oppressing other groups in the community and, and it's our task to see the different aspects of truth and we've been doing this a lot through like uh, story planning exercises we're bringing children, women, vendors, you know, uh, clients and we do this separately and we do that in groups and you can see the whole change in the mechanism actually of like dialogue and politics between them it completely changes when you put them together in one room so um, you need to exert a lot of effort on that and my, my last comment is about the mapping actually uh, we don't use any norms uh, because this is like a preliminary step to at least to develop a preliminary understanding of these neighborhoods uh, but for us what was really understand, uh, interesting is that we asked them to 
draw what they know about their community and and they stand and they say why now why do you need to, to know that and we say like if you're inviting a friend of yours and would like to show him what it's like as with or or meet or uh, Dar es Salaam for example or another area we're working in and they start like drawing with the boundaries first and uh, the the significant um, like remark we had is that whenever there is a cut in a neighborhood by a highway or a road like this they forget about the other part. You know, they just think of the very local side. So, Meet Alba, for example, it's cut into two pieces, and they often ignore the other part on the other way of the uh, on the other side of the highway. They don't just perceive it. It happens also in, in Azbit Kharala. Very few people recognize that as Stablantar is part, actually, that has been split. Uh, one of the like very interesting uh, uh, remarks we had is the um, somebody drew the single tree that they had actually in the Azba to do is to overlap these layers of very rich information coming out because they draw like six or to eight maps in a session, you know, like the different groups together. And the amount of knowledge coming up is really helpful for us to understand these neighborhoods from their perspective, you know, and, and how they're subdivided into community groups and, uh, and stuff like that. So it, it enables us to know this kind of rich information and actually to project it to others, you know, so people would know uh, more about these communities. That also on, on that level, the idea is that we are building a people's atlas of Cairo. So that the idea, um, we have fabulous staff who are doing all of this incredible detailed, some of the mapping, and so that actually, it, you know, sort of the, what's the relationship between acknowledging a place and knowledge? So it, sort of it's it, acknowledging and, and aggregating information and, and, and there being knowledge, which then leads to all these good questions about what to do, you know, what should be done. But, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, basic step of trying to trying to put out more information as Yahya lots of everybody's doing and to see you know what can happen from there um, I also think it's it's um, I, I guess there's a there's a question in, in doing this field work everybody knows there's a lot of different things going on there's a lot of mobilization going along and there's a lot of things that are going on that are not necessarily so revolutionary or anything, but it's, it's about communities figuring out um, uh, w w sort of moments of, of, of uh, a play, uh, sort of intervention at some level. And I, I think that kind of multiplicity and that diversity and these groups are doing that and that these groups are doing that, sort of slowly um, something uh, matters in that sense. So I, I, I don't think it's a, you know, we always critique high modernist planning, but it's not like a one size fits all or, you know, we have to work with this organization because it's pure and that one isn't. I mean, there's, there's a multiplicity there that we can't control or anything or, or, or don't want to control. I, I think the issue of asset based, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to promote that is not so controversial or anything, but that, that that these communities have a lot of assets. When you talk to them, obviously, that it's not just some of them are educated. A lot of them are educated and hyper-educated. And it's, it's, there's not such this great distinction between these neighborhoods and other neighborhoods as it's represented. And the people themselves obviously feel the stigmatization and the fact that they've kind of been, been made into criminals or deviants somehow. And that's really important to them. And so the, the kind of public campaigns and and the just public information and 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 changing that discourse is is really important but i also think the asset based approach is 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 really important and in some sense the financial sustainability of initiatives is really important um, and i guess i would also say this questions of um, I, I wrote a book called Avenues of Participation, so I'm biased. <laughs> um, but it was actually all about informal politics. And it was a critique of kind of just paying attention to elections and local government. So here it's very paradoxical. I found myself in the situation of saying we need to pay a lot more attention to government now. <laughs> and, for, and, and because participation, it, it is a form, I mean, you want representation. You want deliberation. Uh, so many of the initiatives that have happened at, in other countries that have gone through military dictatorships, horrendous inequality, lots of um, authoritarianism. If we look at places like Brazil or Peru or other places, some of these strategies of, of, of deliberation, of, of, of mass participation have problems, but they were also meant to um, try to keep things moving and to change the state 
and to change institutions. So it's not enough to overthrow a government. I mean, the problem here about, I, I sort of disagree with you actually. I think the state is, is in people's lives all the time. And they come against this at least, uh, it's, it's maybe less present, but all kinds of ways in which they have to deal with the state all the time. And everybody knows what to do and people know who to go to and, 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 and so, it's, it might be, uh, I, what we're also trying to do is things are very ambiguous. If you want to do something, it's very ambiguous which laws matter, uh, what rules uh, prevail. There's informal rules, there's formal rules, there's the government rules, and we're also trying to map some of that out. Uh, so, so, and what are the different institutions that you have to go to if you want to build a sidewalk, or if you want to do something about public space, or, so, we are trying to make those things more legible and put it in the public realm for anybody to figure it out a little bit better and take it to the next step. So, so I would say that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, developing ideas and, and trying to seed things. I, I was incredibly impressed with the, the Shabab and the community. They were so, they were just so, uh, energetic and, 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 and critical, but also very, uh, very knowledgeable about their communities and very knowledgeable about how power works. Extremely knowledgeable. So I, I, have, a, I have a problem saying participation, you know, I mean, you said a revolution and all the political scientists in the world will tell you that we had, uh, you know, electoral authoritarianism and enabling authoritarianism, et cetera, et cetera, and, so, and something kind of came up. There was some opportunity, et cetera. So I, I think we have to be careful of being fearful of participation when there's, in my sense, there's, there's not enough participation. I think the government, uh, you know, there was a, we had a, we had an exchange with someone who was a consultant to the government on decentralization, who said, Egypt is not ready for democracy at the local level. Right? Now, what does that sound like? I mean, it sounds like business as usual. So somehow they're sort of ready for the national level, but the lo and, and, and there's, there's really palpable fear that if there's local elections, it will be a Yugoslavia, right? We already I have problems in the Sinai. We already have problems in Port Said, but the idea is if you actually allow for deliberation, maybe you don't need fracturing. And if you actually allow for some kind of local deliberation, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Sinai is going to succeed from Egypt. Um, so there, there was really palpable fear of that. And a lot of the decentralization stuff that's been promoted is all about fiscal decentralization. It's all about paying more for services. It's not democratic decentralization. And of course, the, the municipal governments were controlled by the NDP m far more than any other body of, of, of the parliament, you know, 95% or 99% of municipal uh, uh, elected officials were NDP. And the constitution has done very little at the local government level. I mean, it's very unclear in the constitution exactly what's going to change, but executive councils, yeah, have less power. Um, executive councils have maybe a voice, but not a vote, but um, very little further democratization. And the, the last thing I'll say is in the Constitution, Article 67 says, adequate housing, clean water, and healthy food are given rights. So the Egyptian Constitution, the new Egyptian Constitution, has the right to housing in it. And that's, that's, that's I mean, it sounds bad. It's a weapon. I mean, it's not a weapon. But it's, a, it's, a, it's something that one can work on in terms of uh, um, encouraging the government. It's a constitutional right, but how do you implement it? How do, you, how do you respect it and how do you write it into law? So the kinds of things that we're saying is that there are various opportunities, but they're only opportunities. And how do you try to take it further and sort of institutionalize things and, and, and implement things? Um, I don't know if there's other things. I, I think, of course, like more cross-fertilization, uh, people organizing, people talking for themselves as opposed to us talking about them is, uh, is a great thing and I'll stop there. Yeah. I guess if people have, um, you know, questions or comments or yeah. just free flow yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay. I, I would like to myself to 
contribute also to the discussion. I see also some of the questions revolving around the dynamics within the communities themselves and uh, how they are can be organized, how do they decide on their priorities and so on. And then another uh, set of issues also about the interface with local government and, and, and the role of external agencies uh, like us, like urban planners or, or uh, whatever. Um, I want to comment on local government because this is where I'm, I'm closely involved right now. And I agree with Diane that the, the, the um, government and local government is, is absent and not absent at the same time. It's always there. People know where they are and if they want something. And the very good example of that is when, when people were in Giza government, when they were angry about garbage collection, they took the garbage themselves and they placed it in front of the governorate and the district uh, uh, office. So they, they know that they are there, but it's a passive kind of, it used to be a passive kind of relationship. And um, how to reconstruct this relationship is actually what, what needs to be uh, worked on. The capacity of local government and whether uh, really government is going towards decentralization, the question of the uh, uh, incapacity of local government, this is very serious. Uh, I totally agree with uh, what you've mentioned, Dan, uh, and also Karim about it, but I also pose the question whether the the the, 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 the um, and uh, reading what is in the constitution for uh, the uh, local, uh, what is called the local system or the which means the Nizam uh, al which is also the local sort of governance system. And um, I think at the Ministry of Local Development, we came to the conclusion that electing mayors might not be the best example, because it has to do who is elected and, and who is accountable to whom. And if the mayors are elected, then who is representing the central state? So here comes also the issue of accountability within government itself. So um, the new constitution talks about the, uh, moving from the two council system to the one council system, which the whole council, there is only one council which is elected and which actually makes the executives working, get the executives working, and that's better in terms of accountability. But then you need a representative of the state to ensure that the public good is, is also uh, preserved at the at the local level. So there are some issues here that has to do with fitting this global uh, uh, practice of electing mayors to the Egyptian Egyptian context. Um, does anybody feel that their questions are not completely covered? Do they want to raise more questions to re related to that? Um, I personally. Uh, feel that these, there was this more interest into the how questions that we didn't get much into into it as well. So shall we have another round? Okay. Yes, there was there was a question about um, entry points um, and uh, how to get the communities interested, how to how to get the first step uh, done, right? Which is for for us as externals or even for local government to engage with communities. I heard uh, Damon saying that there is always something there to, to relate to. So you don't go to communities and find nothing. So you find something, you find a starting point, some interest or something. But if somebody can elaborate more on how do you get this very first step going, yeah? Um, Diana or Karim? want to point out that, yeah, the hukuma is there. I mean, the word hukuma, it's the word that you can hear probably the most in streets in Cairo. But the thing is that this is like, um, um, there is a conflict with the government and the state. There, of course, the state is there and people have a relationship with it, but in a conflictual way. So my question was about how to solve the conflict, actually. Because of course people have, uh, even yesterday when we, were at, when we went in Isbet al Hagana, of course they know who is the state and of course they know who, who they have to refer to. But uh, I think that probably before, until before the revolution or probably right now as well, the, 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 the only relationship is just a, a conflictual one. So my question was about how to solve this, conf this um, conflictual relationship. So I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Need to go back to that, but let's have.
for me. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that that uh, there's a there's a political saying that all Americans here will know about um, no taxation without representation. But I think it's actually the, also the opposite is true. No representation without taxation. And one of the big problems with regard to the local government that is not so far is not, of course, the Constitution is actually pretty vague about what's supposed to happen at the local level. It says that law will determine this, but, but um, that that up until this point, the lo the localities do not have taxing power and they do not have legislative power. So so there's no so that they can't they at any level even the yeah, any level any level, level below the national level. So the governors also do not have power to impose taxes, and what that means is they have essentially no or very limited or very also screwed up, one would add, ways of raising money. You know, I mean, they're, 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 um, even things like registering vehicles can only be done at the national level. At the local level, they get to rec they can only derive fees from donkey carts. So, so, I mean, they just have no money. So, so this also means because people are not paying them, people are not giving them money, um, that the ability to, to bring in accountability is, is not, not only the ability to do things, you don't have any money, uh, but also the, the fact that 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 they aren't the money is not coming from the people causes a, a real problem of uh, of, of uh, accountability. Just just something really briefly. Um, uh, in in terms of uh, oh, so now it went out of my head. Um, no, no, just oh, okay. It's yeah. One point. It's 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 very it's very uh, it's very strange that um, maybe it's not so strange, but that there is no other. Um, deliberative body that can make laws except the parliament at the national level. So there can't be regional laws, there can't be regional tiny little things about the town or it's it's all at, at this level. And the money issue is, is of course, you know, incredibly important. But the question that we have is, I mean, Khaled, I mean, you're right, like there are issues about mayors. There are issues about that, but I would like to see a campaign about uh, having mayors in Egypt as a, as, a, as, a, as a deliberative, as a, I mean, there's a lot of good questions about it, but let's think about it. Let's deliberate about it. You let's can even let's try it. let's you can agitate try it. about it. <laughs> that it's just it's just something that is really very common to have representation at a more the subsidiary argument. If that's I mean I'm not a plan the subsidiarity to have sort of if there can be resources and power at a local level that why, why shouldn't there be? Um, I, and I agree very much about your question about conflict. Of course, there's incredible conflict and mistrust and all those kinds of things. At the same time, everyone knows each other and, and there's, you know, there's networks of, of patronage, there's network, all kinds of different kind of networks as well. But the issue about deliberative bodies, I mean, this is something that Gautam said um, this morning about data. Um, okay, you, so you don't have the best data. Well, why don't you make up the data? And then there's still questions about what to do with the data, and there's still questions to do about like, okay, just because you have the data, the people in power are gonna do whatever they wanna do anyway, just because you have the data doesn't mean anything. So, I, I mean, I think that these kind of more deliberative, like dialogic methods, I mean, one reason you have a dialogic method of, of planning, a participatory method of planning, a dialogic pl uh, method of, of uh, local government at the, at the smallest level is to deliberate, is to, is to try to allow people to at least express their ideas, is to, is to fight among themselves and to hopefully have some kind of boundaries, which I guess, Joseph, you, 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 you know, one can train the community workshops, the, the Highlander Institute, the kinds of things that you're talking about. Um, also, it's, it's, about, it's about training with some design and some uh, professional, maybe, sort of interventions if, if, if they're useful. So I think those kinds of practices are helpful. And, and that's not new to Egypt or anything. I mean, you know, Egypt, it's like conference politics for the last 30 years and workshops and trainings. It's, it's not, whatever movement you're talking about, this kind of stuff is not new. About 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 doing these kinds of trainings. Okay. Before passing that on, yes, I will do that. Um, just I want to encourage ourselves over the coming 15 minutes or 20 minutes to also think about some hope about what what can be done. Uh, 
Um, within the communities, yes, there are problems in getting organized in, in deciding on priorities, uh, but there are also communities that are doing this. How can we channel the uh, experiences and so on? Local government, it's even more problematic than local communities. We know the bottlenecks. We know that we have to shake this somehow, should it come from above like through laws and, and, and the constitution and um, a, a radical reform. Uh, yes, it has to do with resources available to them, but it also has to do with almost recreating what is a local government in terms of also its mandate, how it is perceived by citizens and, and so on. So, okay, we need to work on all that. Where are the starting points? What can we do? Uh, Semi-privatized. Uh, there, there, there is a state but there's no deep state in the sense uh, that people know what to expect from the state. They, they know what they can get away with, uh, and they try to get away with what they can. But if you have a norm, there should be accountability to a norm. And, and I think that this is something that we still haven't uh, integrated into uh, the various professions, including uh, governance and local governance where the state has actually committed itself uh, uh, bindingly to certain norms, to certain functions, the people don't know about it. Uh, architects don't, planners don't know about it. The GOPP doesn't know about it. Um, and the question how is, is, is really the operationalization of these norms so that people can map out, uh, whether it's governance or the physical plan, in a way that is clear about the expectations from from the state, um, that that also, uh, for example, a human rights approach is about burden sharing, that the city is not left in suspense, hanging and competing with other cities and the central state for for finance. Uh, there there are a lot of governance questions that are answered by by the norms, um, and I think that there's a lot that we can do with them, uh, but they remain actually very theoretical. Also the, the norm that local government bears the same obligations as the central government when it comes to adequate housing and rights to access to water, uh, sanitation, etc. cetera. Um, there, there are answers. you had it because uh, what I think I heard you say at one point was uh, in response to the exchange around local government was that the Ministry of Local Development has a vision of needing to have a representative from the central government uh, to hold the new unified local authority uh, response uh, accountable. And um, I, I would like to hear more from you about why, why that vision, um, and why not a vision, for example, of social accountability from below or recourse to courts or other, other approaches? Yes, um, I think it has to do with the, the, the system that the government is looking into is very much, it's, it's very close to the French system actually. So yes, you have, yeah, this is what you reckoned, yeah? Okay, um, local democracy, and maybe people in one locality or one government might agree on certain things, but you need to ensure how this is aligned with the national, national interest in general. How does this um, is aligned also with the balanced distribution of resources with other other governments and other regions and so on. So there is a need also to maintain some overview uh, with the with the central government, but doesn't that, that does not mean to intervene in local decision making. So there is a big difference here. So it's like a sort of a of a backstopping um, or you, you can say from uh, the normative point of view is actually like ensuring that national standards are abided by. Let, let us take a very specific example when you're talking about education, for example, okay? So the whole issue of education facilities, uh, the provision of them, the management of the schooling and so on, will, should move to local government. But the, uh, the mayor should have the function 
of course, through um, experts in education on how, where is the government in relation to national standards of education. You see the difference? So here, you're, you're, you're maintaining some observation from the central government on certain things, but the whole operation should be local. So all the issues of decision making, where to place the schools, what, what should be the, uh, you know, the management uh, style of the education uh, process and so on, should become local issue. This is if decentralization proceeds. But then you need to ensure um, who is overseeing the overall quality or the end result quality of education in, in the national perspective. So this is where this issue. So not one person, but rather through the line ministries? Is that the vision? The, the vision that was there be just before the revolution, and maybe we are revisiting it now in the new law, is to have the governor um, uh, appointed, and then you have uh, the a local council with a sort of secretary general equivalent to what is now the secretary general elected, and, and the administration, and so on. And uh, the governor will have a sort of an expert uh, monitoring staff in all the different uh, fields who would really um, only inspect. It's like an inspection. It's called even an inspection governor's office. So the governor becomes the commission, the commissioner, the city, the state commissioners, or uh, commissioner, something like that. But he's not the decision maker at the local level. It's just an observer. So the whole process of decision making should, should become through the elected. Okay, so the elected people decide on the local resources, on the local projects and everything. And also, if there is a dispute between localities or between the elected and the executive, then this governor, as a commissioner from the central government, start looking into it. So there are some, you cannot have, when you talk about local local democracy, it's not, it doesn't mean local autonomy in the federal way, because this is not also I th accepted in Egypt, to go into sort of a federal system where you have everything completely autonomous at the local level. So it's, it's, this at least is assuring to central government that this link will still be there. Okay, does this answer your question? I mean, I, I know very little about political science, but uh, the discussion that we're having in Turkey right now is exactly the opposite, is to see how how a federal government system would have been from the start a much more better system maybe to go, to, to go along with. Uh, so if, if we're learning from each other, I think that's also a good example to follow the discussions within. Can you explain why is that uh, because um, the whole issue of the national standards uh, set in the 1920s for education for, uh, I mean, pretty much everything has a national standard, but that doesn't really translate into the local realities at all. I mean, Turkey is a quite varied country. I, I'm, I'm not aware how, how much variation there is within Egypt. Uh, but uh, uh, definitely uh, one one story didn't fit all, well, it, and it it has been an uh, on, ongoing ongoing 30 years of war as a result of that that we barely are hopefully ending uh, this year. But so uh, in a in a sense, I think to feel the localness is a very uh, very dangerous thing in itself. Like uh, you know, if if this is. If, if we start doubting ourselves by doubting our neighbors or by, doubting, by uh, doubting our own localness and kind of uh, then it, it's 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 already uh, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot by uh, by the standards you're setting and that's and that has been the history of the last 70 years in Turkey that uh, the sort of the doubting the localness one quick thing Oh, just one quick thought from the U.S. context is if it's not too early to think about electing mayors, maybe it's also not too early to think about levels below mayors that especially deal with the built environment. And so, you know, we have, uh, you know, a hundred year history now in the states of things like planning boards and, and zoning boards of adjustment. Um, although I would say, based on our on our experience, the original thought of the people who fought for that in the 1920s was that it should be completely separated from local government. And I think that that has actually backfired in a lot of ways. We want to move from that, but we are current, right now a very centralized country. So maybe there is also some sort of eventual progressive towards 
decentralization towards towards getting the local system operating and so on. No, I, I totally agree with you. But jumping into that, and maybe also we're talking with people at the um, the Shura Council, which is the placement of the parliament right now. They are sort of the legislatives right now. And th th there is these two, th uh, two the senses of directions. People, some people want to move ahead very strongly towards decentralization. Others are a bit fearful of what happens. It's also the same of the participation. It's like the fear of people, generally. And being close to the people and giving them power to decide and to participate and so on. And I personally totally into not supporting this argument. I think this is also the essence of uh, Diane's, Karim's, and Damon's presentations, that it's, it's really worthy of engaging with communities and working with them. And not only that, but also empowering them to engage in this conflictive relationship, how to work on it. I think there's a lot, maybe we, what we didn't cover, how far, yes, Deliberation is important, but also communication, I think, is very important also. How to engage in constructive uh, debates with local government. This needs to be, because I mean, yes, social accountability tools is about moving from shouting, shouting, uh, shouting to counting, but also not to counting, but also to a dialogue. To, you need to, they need to hear each other. Can I also say something? I think that, um, just, just for a second, sorry. That, one of the things that a lot of other governments did at this point in time, when there is a lot of frustration and there's a lot of growing fragmentation in some sense, is I don't see a lot of the government reaching out. I don't see the kind of invited spaces. I don't see the, it should really be the government that's, I mean, yes, there's demand, but, but, but this notion of invited spaces, I mean, there, there's so many more invited spaces that there could be all along. So, so whether it's a planning board, whether it's a meeting with local communities, that the central government says that every high at every level has to have four public meetings a month, just, just vetting of, of things, of public meetings, public deliberation. Like, But I, I would also say, Khaled, that in the French system, and I don't know anything, we, we actually need to do a piece about this, there's very strong mayors, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, so there's, there's, there's a prefect, but there's also elected mayors that sometimes are, 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 are extremely strong and, and there's all kinds of local politics involved. So, I mean, there's always this balance, whatever the system is, between central and national needs and, and local needs, but but uh, the, the balance here is, is extremely... Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I just add a, a last note, it's, um, there is an issue that actually it's a question is how to replicate this on a national level. And it's always the, the thing you face with these kind of participation models is the how to replicate them. And, and I think it's the issue, it's not only about like the multiplicity of these experiences, but also the quality of them. And, um, and, and Brazil actually did a, a great job in, in focusing not only on like, let's say technical solutions to planning, but also also issues like per story budgeting because this is where you can engage a huge number of people on like multiple levels to, to get this engagement. Regarding the French model, which is uh, the last thing I would mention, Paris never had uh, elected mayor, an elected mayor before. Uh, okay. Paris didn't have elected mayors until the 1970s. The first elected mayor in, in Paris was Chirac, who directly became a president afterward. And they were so aware of this fact is that you, you gain just too much power, actually, of this thing. But in the end, the question, who's the government is working for? You know, it's like the state or the people, you know. And, uh, and Egypt had the same. The, how we had ele elected on this, like the mayors of villages. And the end of the 19th century, it ended up in the 20s of the 20th century. And exactly because of the same question, who are the mayors? are uh, uh, loyal for? Is it the state or the people? Yes. Okay. One last. Uh, okay. Sorry. We'll have two comments and then we'll close. Yes. It's actually a question. Uh, they, I was told that uh, a lot of the people actually work for the government. So they're already a part of the state. So how, how does that play into all this? Like a third of the labor force or what is it now? venture to do more participation should be the local government, the people who are closer to the, to the population. And they are, after the revolution, strange enough, more cocooned. They are more more reluctant to go out. Um, I've just heard from the GIZ, and they, they are just having a participatory needs assessment and uh, in, in new areas uh, that they, they work, used to work for. The district chiefs and the uh, secretary generals of the government are more reluctant to go out and attend the public day. They used to be before the revolution. We used to do that. They come and they venture and so on. 
but now they are even more reluctant, which has to do, we have to do something with empowering local government before we start talking about any kind of genuine initiative from government to reach out to people, which they should actually, because this should be the starting point of uh, reconstructing trust between government and, and the people. I will take just one last comment and then we are done. No, I don't want to take us in a different direction, so I'm trying to think how to link it. Okay. My question was more about um, the link between uh, local local governance and the way that people vote in terms of parliament and a president. And, and I'm thinking about identity politics and the differences between when you have uh, community groups who know the issues and very clearly in the examples that you, that you gave us, are, are more than able to identify the issues and the problems, and you know, and they're all very concrete uh, examples of uh, building and food and water and you know, all of these issues. And yet, when people vote, and I think we had this in the the first session with a guy from South Africa, whose name I forget, and he was talking about when people vote, they vote very differently in terms of identity politics. And I think we're seeing that now, right? I mean, people aren't necessarily voting for those who are standing for for specific issues, they're voting based on identity. And so I think I had a question as well about how much time do you think we need to spend in the coming months looking at uh, thank you, sorry, the telling of, or the multiple uh, ways of telling of narratives and stories, particularly around people's um, experiences of violence in, in the last few months. I mean, just my conversations with people have been, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of need for, um, and I, I'm trying to link this to, to my knowledge of Northern Ireland, but there's a lot of need for this kind of telling of people's experiences, witnessing. like witnessing, and, and that's not really, yeah, not really truth commissions, I mean, not at this level, I mean more at the community level, you know, people actually being able, because walking through the streets, you know, we can't deny the fact that in most neighborhoods you have the images of, of dead victims, heroes, however they're depicted in the different multiple narratives, and I think I just wanted to ask, like, is that being addressed alongside the physicality of things we're developing on, how do we link them together, I mean, it's a huge question <laughs> to finish on, but one I think, um, yeah. Okay. It's a yes. good question. I mean, it's an important question. It's an, a good question, which we will take to the final session. Um, thank you very much for the presenters and for the uh, also the participants. And we need to conclude this session and to move on to the. Uh, we need to move to the final session at four o'clock uh, at the Ewart Hall, where we started in the first day. Oriental Hall. So uh, the Oriental Hall, where we started in the first day, and coffee is served there as well.